Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Barco, and I'm Senior Director of Workflow Marketing at Unchained Labs. I'll be your moderator, and thank you for joining us today. Several of our customers and collaborators have presented with us on their lab automation applications this month. Today, we'll hear from Paul Clark on how Dow utilizes lab automation and high throughput research. To view recordings from our previous presenters and to learn more about our products, please visit our website, www.unchainlabs.com. Unchain Labs has configurable options that encompass all the steps needed for chemistry development. Most reactions require some level of solid or liquid dispensing. Uh, we have the tools to do that. There's often a requirement during processing steps to control temperature, temperature ramp rate, mixing, pressure, and gas flow. All of those are important. Since the point of running most reaction chemistry is to collect data, there are a number of ways to integrate data collection, either directly through means such as gas uptake or through integrating third-party devices like gas or liquid chromatography systems. If you've attended all of our sponsored talks this month, you might be thinking, sign me up. How do I get one of these in my lab? And so let's talk a little bit about next steps. So there's more options that can fit on one system. So how do we kind of get to a point where you have something that works for your lab? So we strongly believe in producing solutions in a collaborative manner. Our application scientists work directly with you to understand the goals that you have and the problems you're looking to solve with automation. We design and discuss a proposed system with you and align to ensure that we fully understand your needs. While your system is assembled, we may have more detailed discussions with you to understand uh, how it's working and to make sure we're all aligned. And then of course, we deploy the system with training uh, from our applications team. These options are fit for purpose. So options are, can be fully integrated workflows. That could be something like two big kahunas uh, attached together, a smaller integrated workflow on a big kahuna, smaller applications or task-driven systems like the Junior, or defined automation systems such as Big Tuna. Now, on to today's talk. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. To ask questions, all you have to do is click on the Q&A in the Zoom navigation bar at the top or bottom of your screen uh, and type your questions. We'll get to as many of them as we can, and if we don't get to you, we'll connect you with our speaker for follow-up. Our speaker today is Paul Clark from Dow. Paul earned his bachelor's degree in chemistry from Pacific Lutheran University and his PhD in Caltech uh, from the Grubbs Group. He joined Dow right after completing his PhD and worked on varying projects across Dow's business R&D units. Today, Paul is senior R&D leader in the chemical science group in the core R&D function and leads high throughput research team for Dow in North America. Paul's talk today is entitled Accelerating Research in High Throughput Workflows. Paul, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate the uh, introduction, and it's great to be with everyone today. All right. Slides shared. Excellent. Well, again, thank you, Joe, for the intro. I very much appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to sharing uh, a little bit about high throughput research here at Dow and how we use that to accelerate research uh, in our laboratory spaces. So let's jump right in. Dow is obviously a, a large company. I don't think anyone needs to, to hear details about that. I think uh, what it really does, though, is it frames the scope of the work that it is we do across R&D at Dow. Um, I'm not going to go through great detail on this slide. I think uh, the key feature, the key takeaway is that Dow interfaces across a variety of technology spaces, uh, across essentially any type of material or product that you could imagine. We likely have our, our hands involved in crafting or designing or innovating around that particular material. Uh, we are obviously a fairly large company as well, 36,000 employees, uh, and, and span the globe really with our manufacturing sites. What all of this really means is that Dow's challenges that we're facing from an R&D perspective uh, really span a very broad uh, societal impact, global impact. Uh, and so when we think about R&D at Dow, we really have to think about this in a, a full global type environment. Uh, and I think no one on the line would be surprised to hear that, that our globe is facing challenges today that, that we've never before encountered. And um, you know, many of those uh, key emphasis items are around the sustainability thrusts, around how do, we, how do we make sure that we deliver great innovative science while simultaneously protecting our planet uh, and ensuring that we are protecting it for future generations, not just today's folks. Uh, and so to that end, Dow has established a variety of sustainability goals uh, aligned to everything from circular economy, 
uh, protecting the planet, uh, designing safer materials, uh, and, and then in particular for, for many of Dow's applications, how do we think about carbon reduction uh, as well as uh, eliminating plastic waste? Not eliminating plastics, but eliminating plastic waste. Uh, and so again, these are big challenges. These are things that, that we are going to take time to tackle, but we also have to make sure that we're accelerating in these spaces. So that really is where high throughput can bring a lot of power to bear against these challenges that we face. So from a climate protection, circular economy, safer materials perspective, uh, as well as carbon reduction and eliminating plastic waste, the, these technical hurdles that we face uh, are not going to be simple experimental uh, designs in the laboratory. We're going to have to do some pretty significant innovation and deep digging. Now, if we were to think about that in sort of the 30, 40, 50 years ago perspective before the entrance of high throughput into the research environment, these problems would almost be intractable due to their complexity. Uh, but the good news is we are not in that stage. We really have a, a lot of excellent tools to bring to bear uh, against the challenges that we are facing uh, as a society and as a, a global population. So for Dow, the way that high throughput interfaces with our research is integral to how we do innovation. Uh, high throughput allows us to of course, dramatically increase our experimental productivity, which allows us to filter through new ideas, new innovations on a much more rapid pace than what we would be able to do using the, what I would say traditional R&D workflows one by one on the bench top. Uh, but really the, the power of high throughput is yes, in the experimental productivity, but it's brought to a next level by doing a lot of design modeling uh, and visualizing the data in such a way that we can really glean key lessons out of that data uh, and design better and more focused experiments in the future. And of course, this is an iterative process, right? As we learn more, as we mine those DOEs and the data that we've gathered off of our high throughput equipment, we come up with more honed and refined sets of ideas and innovations that, that allow us to take our research to the next level. So it's also important, uh, the, the way that we bring high throughput and the power of high throughput to all of DAO uh, is really through the way that our R&D is structured. So I wanted to kind of walk you through that briefly. So within DAO, we have sort of two envelopes of R&D, if you want to think about it this way. We have our business R&D envelopes, which are very market facing. They are our business partners interfacing with the customers, understanding the customer's challenges, uh, and working closely with them to solve those, as well as identifying what long-term trends and innovations need to occur. Now, within our business R&D environments, we have three primary technology envelopes, performance materials and coatings, industrial intermediates and infrastructure, and packaging and specialty plastics and hydrocarbons. So these business units um, are executing R&D every day and again, delivering for our customers and allowing Dow to not only make inroads to these societal challenges that we're facing, but also to deliver um, new to market products that allow us to uh, meet needs in ways that customers haven't seen before. But that doesn't really explain how we leverage high throughput to all of R&D. That's where the other R&D envelope, core R&D comes into play. So much like you see in the graphic on the right, sort of this exterior hub uh, of the business R&D units, those are, are the outward facing ones that, that interface with the customers. But at the core of that is core R&D. And core R&D really sits in the hub of R&D at Dow and interfaces with those business units. And this structure is key to what allows us to bring that high throughput research to all of Dow. So within core R&D, we have a variety of what I would say are, are sub-disciplines. So we have analytical science, chemical science, engineering and process science, formulation, automation, and material science, as well as talent and growth. Now, not all of these capabilities have uh, high throughput research aligned to them, but, but many do. Uh, and this allows us to tackle high throughput from a diversity of angles. But the real power comes in because of that integration of core R&D at the center hub of R&D and Dow. Our business partners can come to us and say, hey, core, whichever sub capability it is, we'd like to execute a set of experiments. Can you help us design a high throughput library or a set of high throughput libraries to deliver against uh, those challenges, design those DOEs and, and get the data sets? So by having the high throughput capabilities aligned to the core R&D envelope within Dow R&D, we are able to leverage the entire power of our high throughput arsenal against the challenges all of our business partners are facing. It's a much more effective method of doing that versus all of our business partners independently buying uh, high throughput pieces of equipment and trying to operate that on their own. 
So the other key part is not just the tools, as, as Joe said, right, the, the tools bring a lot of power, but it's also how those tools are implemented that allow us to maximally get the value out of those particular assets. And that's another reason why we actually house high throughput and core. We have essentially a center of expertise, if you will, in high throughput methodology and capabilities. So from a capabilities perspective, right, we've got, you know, a variety of tools highlighted on the, the left hand side of the screen, everything from pressure reactors to formulation pieces of equipment, uh, dispensing systems, etc. Many of these will look very familiar because they're, they're unchained labs assets. So, uh, again, they're, they're fantastic tools. They're very diverse in how we utilize them and what their capabilities are. And again, that's an, another key factor that will come into play as we start talking about designing and implementing complex high throughput workflows. But the tools, again, are just one piece of the equation. The methodology that Dow has developed over the last 15 plus years of executing high throughput research is really a refined system. Uh, and it allows us, again, to maximally utilize our tools and get the most benefit out of those particular assets. So in this case, uh, the way that we think about our state-of-the-art catalysis, synthesis, formulation, um, characterization, film, and coatings capabilities uh, is, again, uh, integrated across all of the business envelopes and, and meets the needs of those businesses in very diverse ways. Uh, but the other part is it's complemented with the informatics and lab automation expertise that we have within core that allows us to, to diversify those tools even beyond what they might originally be capable of doing. And so again, the, this iterative cycle that you see in the bottom right of the slide, the combinatorial DOEs, the automated synthesis, formulation and characterization, the data collection and processing, as well as analysis and visualization, followed by the mining and modeling, and then so on around the circle, that entire process has been really well refined again over those years to allow us to dramatically accelerate our research and our innovation efforts far beyond just the, the acceleration that we get out of the high throughput tools. So let's talk through an example of this. So in Dow, we often use the term workflow. Um, and, and I know many other groups around the, the world and other companies use the, the same technology and the same terminology. So I'll explain a little bit about what I mean when I mean workflow. When we say workflow at Dow, what we really mean is we've taken a set of experiments. So let's say polyolefin catalyst screening. Um, the ability to identify a hit in the polyolefin space, which is obviously, as folks know, a very mature technology field, is a particular challenge where the, the low hanging fruit has been picked, if you will. And, and so there's a variety of processes, a variety of steps in the process of identifying a new polyolefin catalyst. And you can see those here represented on the screen. It begins with say molecular modeling, where we're sitting at a computer doing various designs and iterations on the architectures that we can think about synthesizing in the lab. And once we've refined that space, we then have to obviously go and make those actual catalyst architectures. Then it comes a, a primary screening step. Uh, I'll talk a bit uh, in a moment about what that means, followed by a secondary screening step, followed by the subsequent um, catalyst hit scale up. Now, each of these steps on their own is its own type of process. But when we integrate all of them, step one, two, three, four, into a workflow, what we essentially do is accelerate the entirety of that workflow throughout the course of that discovery lifetime. So the other key element of designing a workflow is that each of these steps has to be matched in throughput to eliminate bottlenecks. So it, again, it's not just about having a high throughput piece of equipment, it's about how we use that high throughput piece of equipment and the number of experiments that we get out of step A all the way through to step D so that we ensure that we don't end up with any bottlenecks in the process. That's how we can take an entire discovery workflow such as this and accelerate all steps of that process in high throughput. And what we found through approaching our, our methodology this way, through trying to think about our research workflows uh, in each of these discrete steps and accelerating those with high throughput capabilities, is that we do indeed see a dramatic acceleration, not just in the throughput of experiments that we can do, but in the rate of innovation and discovery that we can, can hit on here in Dow. And so uh, again, what traditionally might be you know, a decade or more process to identify a new polyolefin catalyst, again, given the maturity and complexity of that space, is now cut dramatically. So we see roughly about a 5x um, increase in speed for catalyst uh, hit identification in our polyolefins workflows through, again, this implementation of all the steps in the process through, through this high throughput workflow. 
So let's jump into some of the examples of some of that innovation that we've identified uh, through this process. Uh, so if you think back many years ago, uh, when polyolefin catalyst systems were first being designed and we were first looking at metal species that could facilitate the synthesis of these large polymer architectures, it was very ill-defined titanium species uh, it, to you know, basically various metal amalgams, things that were essentially put together, folks really didn't understand, nor was there really a good way to understand what was actually doing the chemistry in those particular polymerizations. But again, as we evolved these workflows, as we started to develop these tools and started to screen different architectures, we start to see a, a much more refined catalyst structure. So you can see the, the three different titanium species there in the middle. And, and again, they're not these amorphous metal mixtures. They are true catalyst architectures, these single type catalysts uh, that allow us to start to think about uh, altering polymer properties in very discrete ways. Uh, and also to push the parameters, the process parameters of some of our assets uh, to allow us to manufacture materials in a different kind of way. Then if you progress all the way to the far right to sort of more modern versions of, of polyolefin catalysis like this hafnium species, uh, you can see they're starting to look much more complex. The architectures are starting to actually resemble for, for those of us who are synthet synthetically oriented, more analogous to like a natural product type architecture. So again, these are, are fantastic catalyst uh, hits, uh, things that we've identified that have allowed us to, again, dramatically accelerate how we are able to deliver new materials and processes. Uh, but again, it, it goes even beyond that, right? W what it means, the implications of this, means that we can now have very different polymer properties. So we may be able to use less material in certain applications, which drives at our sustainability goals. Or we can think about packaging things in different ways, as you can see with the, the nice little goldfish there in the center. Uh, the, the diversity of materials that we can generate and the efficiency with which we generate those materials has been dramatically and profoundly impacted by our implementation of high throughput technology in this very complex space. And again, many of these technology advances have, have been identified uh, and been frankly award-winning um, externally beyond Dow. So one particular example that I think is, is really worth highlighting because it, it truly emphasizes the power that high throughput brings to bear is our chain shuttling catalyst technology. And this was the subject of a science paper. So if you're curious, um, I'm sure we'd be happy to get you a reference for that. Uh, so uh, let me walk you through a little bit about this process. So essentially what we have is two different catalyst species. Catalyst one is a poor incorporator, while catalyst two is a good incorporator. Now, you might wonder, what are they incorporating? Well, that is a co-monomer, a species that essentially softens the very rigid, um, glassy, crystalline architecture of a polyolefin. So let's say catalyst one, a poor incorporator, starts growing a polyolefin catalyst chain. We would call that a hard segment of the chain because it's very ethylene rich. Now, if that were to just continue and we were to have say catalyst two growing its own separate chains, we would essentially have a, a binary mixture of, of these glassy hard polymers with very soft polymers from that, that good incorporator of catalyst two. And that mixture alone doesn't really gain you anything from a materials properties perspective. It's, it's a real challenge to try to get the, the rigidity, the material properties that you want out of this while maintaining the, the moldability and, and the melting parameters that you would like to see. So how did we innovate around this chain shuttling? Well, essentially, if you have both Catalyst 1 and Catalyst 2 in a reactor system, and you introduce these chain shuttling agents, these CSAs represented by the pink square, what that allows you to do is essentially pluck a growing polymer chain off of one catalyst and transfer that chain to another catalyst, probably of a different type. So say from catalyst one to catalyst two, that polymer then undergoes additional growth on that new catalyst species and starts to generate this block-like architecture where you have say a hard segment first followed by a softer segment on this new catalyst. The chain shuttling agent can then come back in, grab that polymer chain and transition it to a new catalyst. Uh, and this process iterates throughout the course of the reaction. And so you end up with these hard, soft olefin block copolymers. Now, again, this is really cool technology, but when we set out to design a catalyst system this complex, the scope of trying to do that through traditional R&D workflows, one by one in batch reactors or other systems was simply prohibitive. Um, the design space was far too large for us to ever be able to probe what we needed to probe to identify hits. But rather than spending years putting things through our, our one by one systems, 
because we had those implemented high throughput workflows in this space, we were able to accelerate that process of initial screening down to only weeks rather than years. So a, a true game changer from the perspective of how we thought about doing innovation for this type of technology. And again, the, the impact of this is far beyond just a great new technology. It really is about a new class of materials that brings advantaged properties, both for our customers, but also for, for just society and, and the globe as, as large. So this is, uh, you know, I've told you some great stories. Um, I've highlighted the importance of innovation uh, and the high throughput workflow to innovation. But as I said, we like to put things into workflows. It accelerates our entire process, but that doesn't always work smoothly. So let's say for instance, that we have a, a hypothetical workflow here that's a four step process that we need to make, you know, the, the next great material. So we might have step one and step two and step four in high throughput what happens if we don't have a tool that allows us to do step three in high throughput? Well, essentially, we have a bottleneck in this process. That's where Unchained Labs really comes in. And, and that's where our, our partnership with them has been so critical to us building these types of, of innovation workflows that we have. The tools that we implement have to be diverse. Again, one day they're working for our, our plastics partners and the next day they might be working in an industrial solutions challenge. So the, they have to be diverse in the palette of capabilities that they bring to the table. Um, but it has to be more than that, right? They have to meet a variety of process parameters and other things as well. So uh, again, the terminology on this slide is more of a, a DAO way of thinking about things. We have a lot of uh, CM3 platforms, which, uh, you know, kind of the older version of the big Kahuna systems. But, you know, for us, we implement our CM3s in a, a variety of different ways. They truly are a workhorse in our arsenal. Uh, and now that, that Unchained Labs has moved to these big Kahuna systems, um, you know, we are very interested in, and excited to see the great things that that is bringing to the table as well. Uh, I know one of the things that, that we have used historically it, from the big Kahuna type systems is uh, high pressure screening uh, across a variety of chemistries. Again, everything from, you know, possible polyolefins and, and beyond, right? Those, there are a variety of chemistries that truly benefit from the, the pressure capabilities and the material manipulations that we can do using those big Kahuna systems. But again, as I said with our high throughput workflows, tools are only one piece of this equation. Uh, and Unchained Labs tools certainly bring you know, those capabilities to the table in spades. But really what we've found is these challenges are so complex that there are not typically off the shelf tools uh, that we can look at from our perspective that would work for this. But partnering with Unchained Labs, we're able to identify ways and solutions that they can take their tools, customize them and modify them for our purposes. And so that, that personal and experience that we have with them, their expertise brought to the table, the design table with us, is really what allows us to innovate and, and move toward the filling of those workflows uh, and completion of our innovation pipeline. So uh, again, truly that, that partnership is a major enabler for us and something that we very much value uh, as we continue to forge ahead toward solving the, the challenges that we are facing every day. So in summary, Again, I, I hope I've highlighted, I've said it probably about 14 times during the presentation, uh, high throughput research for Dow uh, is a key component to solving the, the major challenges that we as a company are facing, but more broadly, we as a society are facing. Uh, these are not simple things to solve, and we are going to have to do a lot of work, roll up our sleeves and really dig in uh, from an experimental perspective, and high throughput allows us to be most effective with that type of approach. Uh, integrating the high throughput tools into workflows allows us to further accelerate their capabilities far beyond what we can do uh, just with including uh, one tool or another in an arsenal. And then uh, again, the complexity of these challenges um, are changing the game. Uh, they are leading us to find gaps that we didn't even know we had in our workflows. And that's really where that, that partnership, again, with um, you know, the high throughput tool designers on Chain Labs being a, a prime one, uh, is really key to developing uh, those next generation tools that allow us to continue to accelerate that delivery. Uh, and, and again, the versatility and modularity of the platforms is absolutely paramount whenever we're considering something. Because again, the, the plate of raw project research and the, the slate of work that we're doing is constantly evolving and changing as the challenges evolve and change. And so uh, again, thank you very much for the time. And I hope that uh, this has been an informative way about the, the philosophy and how Dow approaches high throughput research. Uh, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for that talk. We have uh, several questions that have come in already. 
Uh, let's just remind you that if you are an attendee, if you go to the Q&A box, uh, type your question and, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. All right, so Paul, first question we have is, how do you determine which projects or technologies should become or be developed into a workflow? Well, that's a great question. Um, and as I mentioned, workflows are complex. Um, they take a lot of time oftentimes to develop. It is not a, a one week type of, of development endeavor. It can be months to even years at times. Uh, and so what that really means is we have to be judicious in how we think about tackling what problems go into workflows. And that really means that those problems, those projects that we're going to think about putting into workflow have to truly align to not just Dow's short-term strategy, but Dow's long-term strategy. So we really target those challenges that we know are going to be perennial for our businesses, are going to be around for a long time. And so that is worth that effort and energy to put into that workflow because it's going to continue to reap fruits for a long time down the line. And then specifically, what are key factors you consider when identifying a tool for a particular step of a process? Yeah, so that, that is a, another great question and is really truly integral to how we think about the, the process. Oftentimes, you know, when we're scaling something up in a pilot plant or manufacturing facility, the, the exact parameters that go into that particular system, we can't duplicate on the, the small scale. But where we need to focus is really on what are the critical parameters associated with that. So if we may need high pressure and we may need particularly good mechanical mixing and we may need you know, some kind of a vacuum or temperature, or so, some per process parameter um, or some tool capability, we will hone and refine what tools are the right fit for that and what elements of that process we can really accelerate in our high throughput workflows. Um, it's not always a perfect fit. And that's where, again, our partnership with you all has allowed us to de-bottleneck many of those processes. We can take one module out and plug in the right module uh, when those kinds of scenarios occur. Uh, but again, it really is about identifying the certain factors that you really need to focus on rather than trying to tackle the whole thing um, using high throughput. Uh, next question is, how do you approach the challenge of incorporating a very unique process or unique chemistry into a high throughput workflow? Yeah, so it, it actually dovetails nicely with the, the previous question from that perspective, because, uh, again, there are times where it's very difficult to think about how we extrapolate uh, yeah, it can even be a customer test into a, a high throughput workflow. How do we innovate? How do we get useful data out of our high throughput workflows that, that maps onto that, that customer? So really uh, what we try to find, I would say are, for lack of a better word, surrogates. What are those, again, critical tests that, that give us a feel of what will map onto whatever that final process is that we're looking at. Uh, and so it might be that we have to, to customize an analytical technique to really pick out some critical variable in the system that allows us to, to again, map that design space and, and identify hits. Um, other times it's again, a particular set of process parameters that we are gonna evaluate and screen uh, that again, aren't a perfect match to what the downstream system is, but allow us to map the hits onto that downstream system. So finding those correlations there uh, is really a critical part, especially as you get to more refined and more complex downstream processes. Uh, that, that's a really key piece to allow you to still utilize high throughput, even for those complex challenges. Okay. Uh, next question, Paul, is um, how do you find or do you find that automating research workflows reduces the need for R&D personnel? Yeah, it's a pretty common question we actually get on tours. We, we give a lot of tours of our high throughput capability to customers and, and other leaders from, from around academia and other places. And, and this is a very, very common one that we hear because folks sort of liken it to, say, a, a car manufacturing plant or something where you put a whole line of robots down and all of a sudden you don't need folks there to, to manufacture those particular things. But in R&D, it's actually completely the opposite. So as I mentioned, R&D, the, the high throughput capabilities give us a 10 to 100x, sometimes even more acceleration of data. There's no machine that can analyze that data. There's no person, there's no machine that can at this point in time design that next library to truly identify those hits. There's no machine that can make that correlation from the high throughput system you're looking at to the complex downstream process. You have to have the, the human mind involved in that process. And so you have to have researchers in the lab. And I would actually argue, um, and we've seen this data borne out at Dow, that many times when you implement a high throughput workflow, you actually need more people than what you have in the traditional one by one because your throughput, your number of experiments goes so much higher and so much faster that you suddenly run out of catalysts. You need to have people making more of those catalysts. So you need many more synthetic chemists. Uh, you need more people downstream looking at the analytical piece. Uh, and then you also have to have those folks actually interfacing with the tools that are, are delivering the data. So 
for us, we've actually seen it do the opposite of what most people intuitively think about. Um, but so, so yes, high throughput is actually a, a phenomenal people accelerator because it, it lets our folks um, really drive forward that innovation at a faster pace. Yeah, I think I think we get this question a lot, which is um, we have. I've been doing automation for 15 years, and I've never yet I've yet to see someone get laid off because we deployed a, a, an automation yeah. system. It's it's not an assembly line. I think people kind of there's this misnomer, but it just yes. does what you said, which is it gives you more data to analyze faster. And so you still yep. need people there to analyze and understand and interpret the data and figure out what to do next. Exactly right. And I think the other part too that's that's one of the most powerful, right? Especially with some of the automation, um, you know, say solids and liquids dispensing. You essentially allow the the researcher's mind to do what their mind should be focused on is what does that next library look like? What does the data really mean? Rather than you know dispensing 400 things with a pipette, right? That that's not necessarily the value add feature of a researcher, right? Let let a tool do those elements of things, and it'll do it probably more reproducibly than we ever could, and let the researcher really focus on that next innovation and challenge. Absolutely. Yeah, no one goes to grad school and, or undergrad even to, to learn to pipette. Yeah. I, I've done my share of manual high throughput. And let me tell you what, this, the CM3s that we have and the, the big ones, they're beautiful. I, I much prefer using those. <laughs> okay, uh, a few more questions. Uh, how does high throughput enable DAO to be successful beyond just increased experimental throughput? Yeah, so uh, it, it, back to the discussion, I said we, we have host a lot of tours, right? Uh, the thing that we always try to impart is that it is more than just a collection of really cool mechanized robots and automated systems. It, it is about how we use it. And that is a, a powerful talking point when it comes to interfacing with customers and again, interfacing with the outside world. We not only are saying that we're doing really great research, we not only say that we're working hard to, to deliver and, and help with climate challenges, et cetera, but we can actually back that up with how we operate our high throughput capability. So it, it's, truly a, a great communication tool uh, around that type of thing and, and a fantastic uh, selling point frankly for our customers um, you know they see the pace that we accelerate our research using these capabilities and these tools and it makes them say hey we really want to work with with you at Dow because man you guys are, are really cranking out material and, and so again that that is a, a powerful asset for us as we uh, navigate and, and communicate with the outside world and that's again a big part of the reason why we have many tours that come through that capability and it's routinely showcased uh, you know, broadly across not just Dow but beyond. Great. Okay, uh, two more questions. Uh, one is, where do you see Dow in the next five to ten years in terms of high throughput research technology, and uh, are there other areas that uh, Dow will focus on? next that you're allowed to dis disclose, I guess. Sure. Well, you know what I'll say is I'll sort of speak in general terms, right? Um, when I spoke about workflows, right, I, I sort of gave this nice clean picture, like we have a workflow and there's zero bottlenecks. And, and you know, for a contained element of that workflow, that is true. But, you know, for even, let's say, the polyolefin space, right? You, okay, so you can screen catalysts and identify hits, but what happens next? And that's really the continual challenge that we are, uh, we are asking ourselves, right, is, is what is the next step? What do we need to do to further expand this? How do you think about putting, you know, materials properties into high throughput? How do you think about, you know, maybe mimicking scale up elements and, and doing that in high throughput? So it, it's always putting that next challenge in front of ourselves and, and truly from discovery through to implementation, how can we take an entire suite of tools and capabilities and bring that entire process into high throughput. Um, so, so that's one, one thing that I see that's in front of us in the future and, and is certainly something that we continue to develop and drive at. Uh, and then there's other elements as well too, as far as the, the spaces that we are, are tackling, right? I think, uh, you know, in that intro slide where I talk about the challenges that we're facing, you know, you know, zero carbon and circular economy and all that type of thing. Those challenges are going to require us to think about doing things in different ways, which means that we, uh, you know, obviously can be nimble and repurpose tools to direct them toward those challenges, but, but again, are going to cause us to have to think creatively about new solutions uh, to challenges. Again, we, we can't even really forecast yet today, uh, but that we know we're coming. So uh, I would say th there's a constant evolution of high throughput at Dow, and it really is moving rapidly toward, again, trying to, to tackle more of those downstream pieces um, beyond just the innovation uh, discovery side of things. Okay, and last question here, which is, uh, this is actually a callback, I guess, to a previous seminar, which is, does Dow have a closed loop approach uh, using Bayesian optimization and uh, uh, the, the big kahuna and junior? 
a couple weeks ago, we had uh, speakers from BMS and Princeton talk about how they developed that. And I guess just more broadly, is, is Dow looking at machine learning or, or those capabilities? Yeah, yeah, I think you know to to be out there in the external literature at all, you 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 can't ignore this trend of of AI and and machine learning and all that type of stuff. And and you know again, without going into excessive detail, I will just say that absolutely the answer is yes. Dow is investigating this in, in, and really trying to identify not only you know effective partners to work with, but you know we're, what types of areas of research um, you know is this best applied in. Uh, I would say you know it's it's not right yet at the cusp of truly allowing us to change everything what we do, but it is certainly starting to be a significant player in the game. I mean, even, you know, early on with the computational side of things, right, integrating that with, you know, a variety of other elements in our workflows was a game changer for us then. And I have no doubt that the trends in machine learning and other systems will, will continue to evolve and play a similar type of role in how we think about uh, doing research and what types of materials and libraries and designs that we think about into the future. But Short answer is yes, we are absolutely very much involved in this and it is it is an ongoing effort um, within the company. Fantastic. Well, Paul, thanks so much for your talk and thanks for thank you. a great discussion uh, afterwards. So uh, everyone, thank you for uh, who attend, who joined us today. And if you wanna have a deeper conversation about how uh, we could, uh, with our speaker, uh, please get in touch with us at info and we'll be happy to connect you. And if you'd like what you heard in the seminar and wanna learn more, I encourage you to visit our website, www.unchainlabs.com, and check out our upcoming events. Okay, thank you, everyone, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.